first before to start to uh, some rules. Uh, no photo, please, first. And uh, the only person uh, about to do photos is uh, this gentleman. He's uh, our official photographer, so no photo, no video. And uh, the side event will be recorded, but no person from the public will be taking uh, by camera. Even the photographer, he will take photo from the back side, so no, no one will appear on photo. And that's the basic rules before to start, so thank you for coming to our side events. Uh, arbitrary detention in uh, United Emirates, uh, United Arab Emirates, addressing the crisis of civil society suppression. So, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished panel today, starting with Ahmed Hamed al Nuhami, an Emirati political opponent currently residing in the United Kingdom. Ahmed was one of the 94 Emiratis sentenced to the UAE 94 case, a mass trial where he was convicted in absentia to 15 years in prison on the black national security charges by the Federal Supreme Court in Abu Dhabi. This convention followed the signing of a petition calling for increased political participation and constitutional reforms in the UAE. While traveling in the UK for war, Ahmed was warned he would be arrested if he returned to the UAE and as a result, he made the difficult decision not to return home in 2023. Ahmed and other defendants faced a retrial on new terrorism charges and were judged in absentia. The entire trial was conducted in secret with a notable lack of local media coverage. We are also joined today by Matthew Hedges, a British academic and researcher who was arrested at Dubai Airport in May 2018 on suspicion of being a British spy after a research trip to the UAA. Matthew was subjected to solitary confinement for seven months before he re his release. However, in November 2018, he was sentenced to life imprisonment on charges of espionage. He was only able to return to the UK after receiving a pardon letter that month ahead of the EU, UAE's national day. In addition to Ahmed and Matthews, we have the Joey Chia from Human Rights Watch joining us from a view. Joey is a researcher in the Middle East and North Africa division, focusing on human rights abuses in UAE she possesses extensive knowledge of the region and human rights issue at stake. It is also important to mention that the UN Special Rapporteurs and the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention have condemned mass trials, stressing that UAE's counter-terrorism laws must not be used to unnecessarily and disproportionately restrict civil society and civic space. Last January, Mr. Ben Saoud, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism, along with other key UN experts, sent a letter to UAE. In this communication, he expressed deep concerns over the new mass trial, particularly regarding the new charges that violated the international prohibition on double jeopardy and retroactive criminal law. Mr. Ben Saoud also mentioned in this communication that I quote, there are disturbing allegations that some of the individuals on trial have recently been subjected to unforced disappearance, solidary confinement and incommunicado detention and torture of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punition, end of quote. The UN experts are also concerned about allegations which include violation of the right to a fair trial, denial or restriction of access to legal counsel, corset confessions, and lack of effective access to judicial proceedings. While the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention will present its annual report later today, victims are calling on the Working Groups on Arbitrary Detention to investigate the situation in UAE and issue a strong opinion expressing concern over the continued arbitrary detention of individuals involved in these trials. 
They are also urging the international community to exert diplomatic pressure on the EU AA to disclose the fate of the detainees and release all those convicted on trials that fail to meet international standards of fairness. So, after this introduction, I will give the floor to my first speakers. Dr. Uh, hi, everyone. I just want to start with saying that uh, our military detention is a horrible and big issue in the United Arab Emirates for the citizen or for the people who visit the United Arab Emirates. It's a big issue that we can know from it that the United Arab Emirates want to stop the government, the authority, want to stop the freedom of expression, the freedom of speech, and the demand of rights. This is the issue. This is one of the facts of the United Arab Emirates government who show modern life in the facade, but in the behind and the, in the real life, you're going to find another thing. Today, I'm here to speak on behalf of the human rights defender, Emirati uh, human rights defender, uh, including my brother. Khalid al -Murayi. I am one of this group, and my brother, who is now 70 years old, he is in a prison, and uh, he is detained, and as you know, he and his friends are arbitrarily uh, detained after successive uh, unfair mass trial. What happened? For over a decade, the authorities of the United Arab Emirates targeted human rights defenders with the uh, fabricated terrorism charge simply for advocating constitution, constitution, democracy reform. That happened in 2011. In 2011, we wrote a petition as uh, a human rights defender, as uh, activists in, in, the, in the United Arab Emirates calling for democracy in our country. No one wants the dictator life or the dictator system to uh, control our life. So this is our demand, our right as a people. And it was actually written in the introduction of the United Arab Emirates Constitution. And if you don't know, this is not the first petition, but everything was changed in the United Arab Emirates. The first petition was in the late 70s. And the people of the, what they call it, the national, it's like a parliament, but it's not a parliament. It's actually, uh, they, the government hired people there. They wrote this petition before in the late 70s, telling the government, this is the right of people to elect, to choose the people who present them. So uh, it was rejected, but it wasn't harsh as what happened after that. Let me tell you through my brother's story, my brother's story, my brother Khaled, who as I told you, he is 70 years old now. Uh, his children have been waiting for him and his family waiting for him for more than 12 years to be with him. What happened to him? In 2012, uh, exactly in the 16th of July, the authority and the security department came to him to his house and they took my brother. And that's what happened for his friends as well. Uh, since that time, they took him 
to unknown place. No one know where he was, and without any authority from the government. Then, after one year, they saw him in a real bad health. He lost his weight. He was changed, uh, and they saw him in a trial. Uh, he is a citizen of the United Arab Emirates. Is that what happened in the United Arab Emirates? Yes, that's what happened in the United Arab Emirates because he is a human rights defender and who called for democracy. After that, they have a really fake trial. This trial, actually, all, all the human rights organization was banned to attend this uh, trial. Uh, that fake trial gave them sentences between seven and ten years. Uh, my brother got ten years, I get fifteen years because I, I have advantage because I was outside of the country. So okay, they gave me uh, five years more. So my brother spent all his life in, in that prison with many, many uh, things that you can't imagine. One of them, the, uh, the solitary confinement and torture. And uh, then, uh, actually, they, they, they took him uh, and, and his friends after they completed their sentences. Some of them completed the, their sentences from years ago, but he completed his sentences uh, two years ago. They did not release them. They did not release even one of them. They invented a new center, it's called Munasaha Center, which is mean advising center, saying that they have to change their ideology. What, is, what are their ideologies? They say they want to come over the government without any any evidence for that. And they say they have to change. If they don't change, they will not be released. What happened for all of them? And the United Nations called to free them, to uh, release them. They are innocent. And I will tell you about uh, Mary uh, Laura. Uh, I, I, I will tell you about her report. Uh, they told them that you have to release them. They even completed their sentences. You don't even uh, uh, respect your judge, the judge you hire. You don't respect your system. So they did not listen. They did not even respond for any, any of the letter come for them, uh, for, for, for the government. We as family suffer. I'm talking about my family. And if I tell you about my son who was died in the United Arab Emirates because he could not join me, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, handicapped, he was disabled. Uh, he, uh, uh, cerebral palsy. He can't move at all, but he was actually banned from trouble. He couldn't join me. Uh, two years ago, he was died. Uh, uh, he, he, he passed away uh, because he was away from his family. Uh, this is how the family actually suffered. Uh, and no one knows what is happening in the jail. Uh, one of the things happened after many, many letters come to the uh, authority, they invented something new. They point a new trial saying that we uh, established a terrorist, a terrorist uh, organization. So what was the trial? The first trial is about the recycle the trial again, and the people who completed their sentences, now they face a new trial. Before that, no one could reach them. 
Can you imagine no one could be visit, visited the, since the COVID pandemic? Until today, no one can see their situation, how are their health. And few months before, few months before the, uh, the trial, no one could even call them or hear their voices. So this is after, after that, after the trial finished last July, uh, they uh, actually sent for life in a prison. One of them, my brother. It is something shocked us, and uh, we understand the problem is getting worse and worse. Let me tell you about Mary uh, Loa, uh, who, who is uh, the, United, uh, the United Nations Special Reporter on the situation of the human rights defenders and thank for her because she called on the United Arab Emirates uh, authorities to urgent release prisoners of, uh, of consensus who have been in Abu Dhabi in a prison of Abu Dhabi and completed their sentence. That in 2022, and she told them about the people that she knew before, Muhammad al -Rubin. one of them, she said they are innocent, and uh, the terrorist uh, organization that they will talk about is fake, and no evidence of that. So. Uh, Unfortunately, there is no response at, uh, as well from the United Arab Emirates for this report. They don't respect the United Nations. They don't respect anything. They don't respect their judge as well. Uh, the justice system, uh, they don't respect it at all. Uh, nowadays, wha what is happening? As I said, the problem is getting worse and worse. And we are, we want they to cooperate with the uh, working group in arbitrary uh, detention who uh, knows, who knows this problem is getting worse and worse. And the United Arab Emirates today, the situation there, because of the arbitrary uh, detention, the people actually, they are threats. They are threats. And they are uh, living in the United Arab Emirates in a bad situation that they are terrorized uh, not to express their idea or to express their belief or to express their freedom of uh, speech. Uh, I will end my speech with saying our responsibility today for the people who defend the human rights in this world is very big and getting bigger and bigger today because the world is getting worse, unfortunately, as we see the human rights is targeted everywhere. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Now I will let you the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Can you all hear me at the back? Okay, thank you very much. So my name is Matthew Hedges and I'm a, an, an academic specializing in the UAE and in authoritarian states. I'm also a victim of torture um, at the hands of the UAE. The UAE's state security department the equivalent of the East German Stasi, uh, the Soviet KGB, or China's Ministry of State Security, detained me when I tried leaving the state after two weeks of fieldwork research. I was held for nearly seven months. During this time, they forced medication on me, which I am still dependent on. Threatened my physical safety and stated that if I don't comply, I would be renditioned to an overseas military base where I'd never see the light of day again. Given the high number of, of deaths within the UAE's state security detentions, 
I knew uh, there was a very real and present threat to my life. I am lucky to be alive. Uh, I witnessed the torture of others. Uh, and through this experience and my own research, it's very clear to me that the, U the Emirati authorities interpret that their gravest threat is from their own civilians, is on, from their own citizens, sorry. As a result, the UAE state security has, has morphed into an all-encompassing organization that not only restricts controlled behaviors, but is successfully destroying individual agency <coughs> and even generating the, the lack of critical thinking. You can see decision making, you can see that thoughts are naturally being limited because they understand the potential risks that independent thought carries. <clears throat> Since my release, I've been a, a proud advocate against torture, as well as raising awareness of the UAE's repressive behaviors. For this, UAE has harassed me and has tried to intimidate me. They follow me around London sometimes, they take photos, they hacked my phone with Pegasus as well as that of my barrister, um, and they tried to get newspapers to, to print stories about me um, based on supposed sensitive and confidential information that was also false. This is me as a, as a British citizen in my own country, where I'm supposed to have a degree of protection for my own state. Try to imagine what challenges remain for, for their own citizens who are then fighting against the state with maximum control. Um, and as, as Ahmed said, it, it, it's something which realistically you can't can't survive within this environment because everything is against you. <clears throat> um, because the state security department is supposed to be protecting its citizens, but is in fact attacking it, this really underscores the, that lack of, of, of civil society and how comprehensive this is. It's not simply the legislation. It is now uh, such a comprehensive attack. There is a, um, that limited freedom people have is, 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 it comes from education, it comes from social engagement, as well as the, the legal avenues, which also criminalize and punish those who uh, go against the grain. While this is still a relatively unknown subject, the UAE's support and deployment of transnational repression is far more known. The UAE has been heavily involved in multiple civil wars, including Libya, including Yemen, um, where there has been uh, widespread and comprehensive condemnation sanction for some of their activities. More recently, and, and certainly more alarmingly, has been their backing and support for Ahmedti, for General Mohammed Dagalo, and the rapid support forces in Sudan. Um, the evidence is, is widespread, uh, it's unrefutable, but the UAE still tries to, to deny these accusations. Weapons have been directly delivered, and they are being delivered through Chad. They work with, with Russian forces, um, weapons come from Libya, Ethiopia, and these are not just small instances, this is directly fueling the civil war, this is directly fueling that mass uh, system of abuse that is occurring in a country which, which shouldn't be in this situation. 
if it wasn't for the UAE support, the war wouldn't be uh, in the state it is and it, it wouldn't be occurring. The UAE's approach to maximum control, however, is right. It's right within our own states, it's right within neighboring states and, and internationally. This trend is only increasing. And unless these actors, these individuals, these entities that, that practice this and facilitate these activities, unless they're held to account, this will simply only increase. It will further undermine global security. It will support the actions of, of other states to continue this. We've seen what's happened at Interpol with the abuse of red notices, with with the pursuit of, of distance from other authoritarian states. Um, there have been several uh, high profile cases of, of rendition, um, which is very simply um, destroyed a trust and semblance in the international system, in the international system of law, and occurred while the president of Interpol, the Emirati uh, minister, Ministry of Interior's Inspector General has overseen this. Sometimes Emirati support is repressive through such the delivery of, of military weapons to, to warring states, but it can also come as a positive through co-option, through facilitating unity and cooperation. Here we can even see in this building some rooms have been donated um, by the UAE, it's the same at Interpol and elsewhere, and it's, it's, it's very good for states to contribute what they can do, but when questions aren't held and asked about what conditions this comes with, um, this is how and why the UAE's transnational oppression has been uh, so prolific, because no one is willing to truly highlight their activities and to hold them to account. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. And um, hand over. Uh, thank you. So now I will give her the floor. Last year, to give an example, COP28 was, of course, held in Dubai. 
Um, and we, in the lead up to COP28, had a myriad of, of climate groups, journalists, um, states who were working on uh, the COP process, um, engaged with Human Rights Watch to get a sense of what types of Emirati groups, independent civil society Emirati groups that were on the ground um, to work with um, to see what their positions were on you know, certain aspects of the COP process and, and to work to raise their voices um, through the, this forum. Unfortunately, we have to come back time and time again to say that there simply are no independent civil society and rotten groups on the ground. Those were stamped out more than 10 years ago. And all of those brave human rights defenders, political dissidents, many of whom who are judges, lawyers, teachers, are either in exile or they're in prison or they, are, they have been silenced. Um, and you know, we've seen such, we've heard such compelling uh, testimony today from Ahmed of what that experience really um, is like. And um, again, just to paint a, a sort of picture of, of simply how um, strict the crackdown is in the UAE, Human Rights Watch ourselves uh, were not, we were not able to get access to the UAE. Um, for nearly 10 years. Um, we were able to access the country during COP28, but of course this was um, you know, due, to, due to the fact that it was a UN-backed process. Um, and I was able to go again in the spring, sort of the second time in the past 10 years, um, to you know, do some advocacy um, around the mass trial case. And in some of the advocacy targets that I had contacted, you know, mainly embassies um, to discuss the due process fair trial violations that we documented that I'll um, discuss very shortly. Some of these embassies themselves were warning us off and saying that we should do these meetings over Zoom. Um, it is you know, simply too um, dangerous for a human rights organization like Amnesty, like Human Rights Watch to come on the ground and speak directly um, to, to diplomats and to other advocacy targets about the violations that are ongoing. And I think that that speaks volumes that even an international organization um, cannot, uh, is warned off by other diplomats from doing you know, what is our sort of bread and butter advocacy. Um, and so yeah, to, to go back to the mass trial um, that Ahmed uh, detailed, um, we released uh, um, a number of reports over the past few months um, over about the many due process fair trial violations that we documented. Um, as Ahmed mentioned, this case uh, was brought during COP28 itself, even while the eyes of the world were on the UAE during COP28. This was not a deterrent for them to bring a slew of new spurious charges. Um, against what is effectively the same group of human rights defenders, political dissidents, that has already been in prison on unfair trial, um, uh, uh, in prison after an unfair trial for many years. Um, so some of the due process violations that we documented were extremely restricted access to case materials. The lawyers for the defendants could only view the case documents, uh, case files in a secure facility. Um, under the direct supervision of the public prosecution. They were not given their own individual copies of the case files, um, and they had to request um, access each time they wanted to view them. Um, not all of the defendants were even able to get access to the lawyers themselves. Um, and there were many instances throughout the trial um, where the judge, the, judge, uh, the presiding judge, um, actively directed witness testimony. Um, we also detailed very serious allegations of abuse and torture. Um, many of the defendants have been held in prolonged solitary confinements, uh, which of course amounts to torture. We also detailed allegations of uh, physical assaults of some of the defendants, um, and also um, in at least one case, very loud music was played um, during the evenings, preventing uh, some of the defendants from sleeping at night. Um, and all of these uh, you know, violations were thoroughly documented by ourselves, um, by Amnesty, by other partners. Um, and uh, before the verdict, um, which was handed down in July of this year, 
we warned many of the UAE's closest partners that we were expecting abusively long um, terms, uh, abusively long sentences for, for those in the trial. Unfortunately, in July, our worst fears were realized when 43 of the defendants were sentenced to life in prison, five were sentenced to 10 years in prison, and another five were sentenced to 15 years in prison. Um, and as I mentioned in spring, um, I, I traveled to Abu Dhabi, I traveled to Dubai um, to detail the myriad of violations that we had documented. In the lead up to the July verdict, uh, we met with anyone who would meet with us um, to raise the profile of this case, to, um, yeah, to, to warn that we were expecting these long verdicts, um, these long sentences. And even after the verdict, the verdict was handed down, of course, we engaged with um, you know, a, a, a number of web states as well to encourage strong public statements condemning the trial, condemning the violations, and calling for the release of each of the defendants. Unfortunately, there has not been a single public statement about this trial um, from a state um, from a member state condemning the violations or calling for the defendant's release. Um, and it's, it's absolutely devastating um, that the UAE has so effectively been able to leverage its economic and security relationships that even a trial as historic um, and as abusive as the one that happened this past year did not meet the sort of standard for you know, a, a public statement to be issued in condemnation. Um, so as Human Rights Watch, and as I, I'm sure Matthew and Ahmed would agree, what we would hope um, that you know, uh, member states of the, the Human Rights Council um, encourage strong public statements condemning this verdict. Um, and as Matthew you know, so eloquently detailed, is the UAE's domestic human rights crisis also has regional implications their sense of impunity and the lack of accountability for decades of abuses has spread beyond its borders. Um, Yemen, in Yemen, in Libya, now in Sudan, a, a myriad of IHL um, violations are, um, have happened and, and are ongoing. And this lack of, um, the lack of accountability at home has led to this uh, you know, undermining of peace and security regionally abroad because you don't have those domestic voices um, that are there to um, hold security services to account. Um, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much. So that will end the, the first part of our side event with our speaker. And now I will give the floor to the assistants. So if there is any question or comment. One. So the floor is yours. I would like to thank I would like to thank my friend Terry uh, for organizing this side event. CAB is doing a great job for the last uh, year. And this is and this is one of the events. Uh, let me make my uh, comments in Arabic. First, Qadi in Majlis Hukuk al Insan, Yetanawal Awa Hukuk al Insan, Bishak al Am, and the Akar, Wakir and the Sorry, there is no translation. Okay. Okay. But most of them are Arabic. Okay. But we have to understand if you want to get an answer from us. I don't want to interrupt you, but just the fact that you, if you want people to, uh, <coughs> to understood first and to after answer, uh, for instance, me or uh, uh, Mr. Matthew, uh, we cannot understand. Okay, so I can, can, uh, can repeat his question. Is it okay. When, when he if you can translate. Yeah, I will translate. Okay, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, what What I believe that. Uh, ما أعتقد أن مجلس حقوق الإنسان هنا يتناول أو حقوق الإنسان بشكل عام وليس قضايا فقهية. استمعنا إلى جزء من الحديث الخاص بالمتحدثين يتناولون أوضاع فردية سواء كان مرتبط بشخص أو بأخوه أو 
حالة أخرى وهذا خلاف ما عليه الآليات الدولية نحن هنا نستمع إلى انتهاكات واسعة في مجال حقوق الإنسان مثل ما كلنا عارفين أن المقررين الخواص يعملون على متابعة ما يعتقد أنه انتهاكات لحقوق الإنسان وبالتالي يطلقون نداءات ولا يطلقون مواقع محددة المواقع المحددة تطلق من قبل آليات أخرى وهي في إطار النداء إلى الدول من أجل حثهم على أن يحسنوا من أوضاع حقوق الإنسان فما يعني ذلك أن هنا نأخذ بآراء المقررين كثوافل هنا في الاتحاد العربي لحقوق الإنسان متابعين لهذه القضية من 2013 بشكل مستمر سواء كانت في المحاكمات أو في ما يتعلق بحقوق السجناء والموقوفين ونحن ندرك أبحاث هذه القضية في إطار الإسلام السياسي وليس في إطار انتهاكات حقوق الإنسان ما استمعنا إليه اليوم من بعض المتحدثين من معاملة سيئة واحتجاج وتعذيب لم يستطع أحد إثباتها بالذات في ظل وجود آليات وطنية تابعة منظمات دولية تابعة المحاكمات ثم تابعة الأوضاع مهم أن نؤكد على أن السجناء أو من حكموا بأحكامهم بعد انقطاع أو بعد انقضاء أحكامهم انتقلوا من الحكم إلى مراكز تم إنشاءها وفق القانون وفق المجلس الوطني أقر قانون المصالحة الوطنية وأصبح قانون وانخرط في مشاريع خاصة بالمصالحة الوطنية الأحكام الأخيرة صدرت بعد متابعات لقضايا استمرت ربما أكثر قضية جمعت فيها أدلة لمدة أكثر من عشر سنوات إلى أن جاءت الأحكام مهم أن نؤكد على عدالة القضاء مهم أن نؤكد على قضايا انتهاكات حقوق الإنسان لكن في إطار ثوابت وليس في إطار نظري أو اتهامات لا لا يعكس الواقع أختم فقط بأن الآليات الدولية لحقوق الإنسان مثل ما لها رأي سلبي لها أجس فنش لها رأي I'm following I read it when I understand it's one idea actually لها بعض الآراء الإيجابية ولها بعض الآراء السلبية ليس بما يتعلق بالإمارات فقط بس بما يتعلق بحالة حقوق الإنسان في جميع دول العالم شكرا جزيلا لكم واتمنى ان نكون اكثر تعبيرا عن الحقيقه والواقع في مداخلتكم شكرا شكرا فيرست اوف اول اي ويل تيل يو اباوت ماي برادر كومنتس هي سيد ذات يوجوالي ذا يو اس دو نوت تيك كيس اوف انديفيدوال اند ات از يوجوالي ذا ذي توك اباوت ذا جنرال بروبلم لايك ذا هيومن رايتس بروبلم And what we were talking about is individual. And uh, he has an organization, and the organization actually uh, observe about what is happening in the United Arab Emirates. And what happened in the United Arab Emirates, it's under the Islamic political, Islamic organizations. This is the problem of the United, with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and uh, the problem, uh, it's actually what, what the United Arab Emirates did for the last trial, it's, it's because there was uh, uh, an investigation extended to 10 years to find out there is a new organization, which is a terrorist organization, under the Islamic yes. terrorists, okay? That, this is the... Uh, okay, let me let me now uh, no, answer uh, you. You 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 yes, you yes, said what yes, you want. And after you they finish their trial, they are moved to Morocco. Okay, all right. Yeah. Now about the um, it's actually when we talk about individual individual case, it's an example, and this is an easy and common sense. It's it's not something that we created. When I talk about my, my group, and give you an example about my son, I'm telling you what are the family of my friends suffered of. I'm one of who suffered, but I'm giving an example. And I'm not here to talk about Ahmed al-Nuaymi or Khalid al-Nuaymi. 
what I'm talking about a huge group, a huge group in the United Arab Emirates. We actually signed a petition, and we know this problem started with that petition. We are calling for a democracy, so this is the problem. The problem, when you talk about the government now, everyone knows how the action of the United Arab Emirates in Egypt, in, 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 in uh, Yemen, and everywhere. And we know that the United Nations found a presence in Yemen. It's actually controlled by the government, the United Arab American government. So this action, it spread in, in all the region. We know what happened today in, the, in, in, in Sudan as well. Everyone knows about that. So this action, it's actually uh, uh, spread in, in, in all the region, unfortunately. So this is ideology of the United Arab Emirates. Fred? We, we have to keep on our topic. And not doing yeah, yeah. yeah. And this, no, this same is, thing. This is right. We yeah. have to, to be in, in the topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is, this, is, this is what I'm telling him. He is saying the United Nations talking about general things. It's a general. It's more than one individual case. It's general. That's what I prove for you what is happening in the United States. The other thing, when you say that you are observing, I know United Nations could not even visit one single detained one. Who can visit them or know about their situation? My, uh, our families could not talk nowadays. They could not talk. Who can talk in behalf of them? When you say there are organizations in the United Arab Emirates who observe as a human rights organization, me and you know this is under the government. Look, you know, the, as uh, I know, please, as please, I know, please, let, and me, then let, I me, let me talk. It's not your time to talk. Okay? You, uh, Sorry, right, it's my time. No, uh, just uh, I recall our rules. The first rule is to be uh, nice with people. We are here to talk, we are here to exchange ideas. And I just uh, it's a, yeah. You're right. United Nations is a general topic, yeah. but we have been working together, and we know that general topic goes to people. Thank you. Okay. And me, since I'm here, 2016, every side events we are anti-academic, human rights activists, lawyers, but also people, because without the testimonies of those people, we know that it's just stay a general topic just a general discussion. But sometimes, all of us, there is room to improve. And sometimes, all of us, we have to confront the reality. We have to, to see that, OK, general topic, arbitrary defunction is a general topic. I'm running this case on France. This is not a general topic for the one we are in jail. <coughs> this is a reality. So sometimes, we go to general topic, but sometimes, we go to testimony, to just all of us to see that we are not talking of general topic, we are talking about people that suffer in jail. Yeah, yeah. thank you. If, yeah. if, if, I'm, if I may just uh, kind of support it, when looking at the UAE state security legislation, which uh, somewhat oversees and, and encapsulates every other legislation, the definition and terminology of, of, sent of uh, confidential information is defined by even public news and information. So if there's no public news and information, and you are then going on the reports of, of those public bodies, yes, of course, you do still, as evidence, have to lean on that. But if there's also other, other forms of evidence that can support, contradict, uh, oppose other narratives, then it does have to be incorporated. The issue with, with that suppression of civil society and civil rights across the Emirates is the fact that state security legislation, as I said, when I say it restricts people's movements, abilities, to the extent that to get a job in the public sector, you have to have an interview with, with state security. To 
be able to sometimes even travel, you have to have interviews. To, to do anything, it's subsequent to a review of a highly securitized body, which is not held to account in any way. There is no public forum for this. There is, you can't have a, a, a normal lawyer in a state security case. And when there have been lawyers in state security cases, uh, I believe, he was then sentenced to life imprisonment. So you're then dealing with a, with a, a vacuum whereby you either ignore it because there is no information, or sadly you do have to uh, lean on um, some forms of personal testimonies and, and collecting together. So thank you. Uh, I will have to end uh, that event because we have still three minutes. Is uh, Mrs. Shea want to add something to uh, our discussion? Okay. Uh, so thank you all of us to come in and uh, we open the discussion and uh, our panelists are still there. If you have any questions or whatever you want, we are here. So thank you to all of us to come into our panel.